trying to peek. No worry, you look pretty. <laughs> How are you, buddy? I'm good, man. What's going on? Busy day? Uh, surprisingly, yeah. I've been fucking bored out of my mind for two, three days because I'm went, next Wednesday is my last day, so they have, I don't have many patients. Oh, uh, you officially move down to Miami? Yeah, next Saturday, a week from Saturday. You excited? It's go time. Hell yeah. When did you start work immediately? I got a couple of weeks off. My parents are coming down to visit and then um, I'll check out the area and uh, kind of start ramping up. Cause once I start, I probably won't, won't really slow down at all. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll enjoy myself for a week or two. And then, um, and then after that we'll rock and roll. Where are your parents coming down from? Massachusetts. Okay, cool. All right. If um, the flights are $40 each way. Bro, I'm like, I'm about to start traveling again, I think. <laughs> I was like 40 and that's JetBlue. Yeah, I, I've been I've been racking up fucking reward. I've been just buying shit left and right while I've been stuck in quarantine. So I got fucking credit card reward points out my ass I could pay for like my next seven flights. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's crazy. I'm like $40, what the shit? Yeah, they've been like that for a minute now. Hell yeah, the orange monster, let's go. Every day. You know Doc's ready. We are ready. What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the headquarters. Welcome back to BDGE Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas, as always, or as sometimes. We are joined by Dr. Jesse Morse of the Fantasy Doctors. We've kind of got a, a plethora of topics to discuss today. We're not just going to go player by player, but we have some situations, some players, some randomness that we're going to just dive into today. Uh, and the first thing on most people's mind, as it has been for the last four months or so, has obviously been COVID-19 and the effects that that is going to have on the preseason, uh, just individual players, the actual NFL season itself. There are a lot of angles we could kind of approach this with. Uh, we won't really go into whether or not, you know, the NFL season is going to happen. Let's look at it from more of a player individuality standpoint. Let's look at it from... You know, I've had a lot of comments on people for players like Mark Andrews, John Brown, who already suffer from specific illnesses, right? Ones that are probably more vulnerable to something like COVID-19. Um, I don't know if that actually makes them more susceptible to getting COVID-19. I don't really think that's how it works. But, you know, it just it, right now, the disease, the virus in itself is, is such a mystery. So obviously, you're not going to be able to unearth anything that's groundbreaking to us right now. But from a fantasy standpoint, I know here's here's my concern I guess with what people are looking at for this year is we hear you know you get the the virus you you quarantine yourself for two weeks and then you're probably good to go but there's a lot more that goes into it than just you know those 13 or 14 days that you're away from everybody right it affects it affects your body it affects your brain it affects different things in different ways and obviously someone who needs to be functioning at a hundred percent every time you step on the NFL football field like this could be a huge detriment to people so to your best estimate to your best knowledge like take us through what you would expect to happen to an NFL player this year say you know week two rolls around they have testing in place the NFL season's happening someone tests positive for it they're missing a minimum of two weeks right like we don't really have much in terms of like research to go off of with this fucking virus. So like, you know, I'm imagining it's going to affect everybody so differently uh, on a different scale. Like what's your, I'll kind of just give you the mic here because there's so many angles to kind of uh, hit it from. So the, what I've realized about this and I spoke about this in, a, in another podcast, a couple of days, <laughs> the more I talked about it, I'm like, the more I talk about it, the more questions I have. It's like it, one statement leads to more questions and then it's just more questions. Nope. And it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. So there's going to be, this is going to be a, a season and it's been a year for, for the ages. And what we're going to see is you're going to have to expand your, your benches for, for fantasy. Excuse me. They're going to have to have a taxi squad or something like that. Because think if you three of your offensive linemen all catch COVID at the same time. Yeah, um, I didn't even. There goes your running most game. People are thinking about. Yeah, most people are just thinking about it strictly from like a a skill player standpoint. This is it's going to be such a messy year because your your quarterback goes down and like the entire team goes down. A couple offensive linemen catch it. Your running back is shot. The quarterback might. Man, this is going to be fucking. What if crazy. what if Mahomes catches it? That's like twenty million dollars. 
I wonder, yeah, right? The amount of games he, he, <laughs> missed, he misses six weeks. There goes fucking 18 mil from Kansas City. It's like, yeah. so it's like, then, you know, and so everybody's like, oh, they get it. Probably they won't be symptomatic. And then they automatically come back. What if they don't feel like they're 100% when they should be able to come back? What if Von Miller saying three, four weeks out after he caught it because he has a history of asthma, which is not uncommon, especially in African-Americans, um, they, what if he's still like, I can't, there's certain things I'm running around the house and I can't even breathe. And like, I'm not, I'm not in pads trying to chase a quarterback. Yeah. Like in that case, in that case, does, I'm assuming that just makes them more susceptible to injuries because the people that are also on the field with them are going to be playing at a much higher rate. Like if you're coming back, mm -hmm. like these guys, you know, you talk about it a lot. Like these guys think they're superhuman. So when they're supposed to be resting for two weeks and they come back, after an ankle sprain in seven or eight days like they make themselves more susceptible because they think they're stronger they think they're ready some of these guys might have covid come back feeling 70 percent or 80 percent get on the field and go against these dudes who are running at 100 percent are going to knock the fucking lights out of them so um, i'm assuming from like a physical physical standpoint though like within your body does it actually make you more susceptible to injury or just that like you're playing at a, a lower level than most people um there's gonna be some fatigue uh so what, what I've learned, and I was speaking with one, a really high level trainer in Miami, maybe about a month ago or so, and he, he, he would have been in the NFL was a, a back injury, but he was like, what I've learned is that these guys need to be in overall good condition. You don't want to train a, a, a back or, or whatever specific body part. I need to get them overall in great condition because in mid season, I need them to be able to continue to perform at a high level because when they start performing at, at, at less than perfect, their form starts to give way, which then leads to new injuries, which then right. derails their season. So if you keep them at optimal peak condition, then they're going to be able to maintain that uh, good form and, and be able to perform as expected, which then allows them to continue to perform as expected when you have something like this, this is going to knock the wind out of your sails. So you're no, you're not, you're going to try to cheat with it, trying to catch up a, a pass rusher or, or whatever, you know, it depends what position you are and you're not going to be able to have perfect form or you're not going to be able to play it as many snaps. You're going to, I mean, think about these, these wide receivers who are running full sprints uh, every other play or every third play, like, yeah. This is a, a, a indirectly an inflammatory condition, but it's affecting the lungs. So they're probably not going to be able to recharge as quickly. Now think of the big guys on the line, depending on which side of the line, who are sitting on the sidelines inhaling oxygen through a mask without COVID. Yeah. So it's like, and then you add in temperature, you add in height, you know, Denver. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of factors that this is just like throwing an entire monkey wrench into everything. And, and there's one thing that really hasn't been mentioned and, and it's starting to creep up in baseball and, and I'm happy that hopefully they can figure this out before NFL rolls around Pro rating payments, not even that it's the lack. So the testing is not running as quickly or as smoothly as you'd like it to. So Sean Doolittle, closer for the Washington Nationals. Oh, there's Last a few days there. gap in between, like, when you get the results. and so, Yeah, more, more, they have, I think the confusion here is that the public had kind of been led on to believe that we were going to have tests that gave you the, uh, the the results within 15 minutes by the time. You know, we, we heard that two or three months ago, so we figured, oh, by yeah, the time. But those aren't available yet. Well, at least not that I'm aware of. If there are, they would have been using them, you'd think. Yeah. So, and the other problem is, I don't know what the NFL is going to do. But the other problem is the, M uh, the MLB coordinated a contract with a lab in Utah. So in order to get your sample, so say you're on the Yankees or the Mets or down here and, and with the Marlins, they're going to swab the nose, swab, probably swab the throat too. Um, say it's on a Friday. They will send that off to Utah because it's a sample. They can't, right. you can't do that from afar. So you have to send that to Utah. So that's what, half a day, give or take. Then they have to run the sample, assuming that they can run it on time, but they also have thousands of other tests to run for the other players and staff. 
and then they have to turn around and send the results. Well, what happened with, with Doolittle was that he took his test on Friday. On Sunday morning, they asked him to take another test because they're doing it every other day, but his results from Friday weren't even available yet. So yeah, he's like, what, he's like, what if I had a positive then? I'm probably going to have a positive now. I'm assuming I had a negative then, but you know, and then the, the other question is what about the people he interacted with on uh, Friday, Saturday and Sunday morning? Dude, even from a personal standpoint. Yeah. Even from a personal standpoint, I got tested. Like I went to a, a, a protest March here in, in Manhattan and there was a lot of people there. So I wanted to get tested. I got tested a, a few days later, maybe five days later. I didn't get the results back for five or so days, but like I was walking around in between when I got tested and because it was a weekend, you know, whatever it was those five days. And like, by the time I got test results back, I was like, dude, I feel like I need to get tested again. Cause I was around so many people. So that seems to be a much bigger issue than people are kind of letting on because I think we were kind of led on initially to believe that this wouldn't be a pro- like the whole testing thing wouldn't be a problem by the time the NFL comes. It almost seems like anyone you have on your fantasy team will be impacted by COVID one way or another, whether it's them personally, whether it's another offensive weapon on their team, the offensive lineman, even like head coaches. What if Kyle Shanahan gets it? Like he's not going to be fucking calling plays from uh, his bedroom when he's quarantined. And you know, what are the 49ers if they don't have Kyle Shanahan calling the plays for two or three weeks, you know? So there's a lot of fucking crazy variables to that, that could come and, and uh, come into play here. You know, I mean, there's more questions. One answer leads to a new question, which is like this crazy snowball effect. I know. Um, you know, so it's, I mean, and, and, and then you're assuming so so the protocol from what i've seen is that they have to quarantine for 5 days then they have to test once get a negative presumably wait 24 hours and then test again and get a second negative have we then had they uh, will be eligible have we had any updated numbers i don't really know the stats on, on the virus in itself have we had any updated numbers or positive results in terms of like what the average uh length of having the viruses for because you know we say quarantine for two weeks but have there been any numbers that have come out that say oh most people now have it for like seven days and then they can test negative for it so the reason why the 14 days came about was because the average person uh if they're going to be positive they're going to be positive at the average was 11 and a half days so hence the 14 days they okay. just made it an even but that's the so that's a good question depends on the, the, the type of test, to be honest with you. So the, the most accurate test that will tell you if you have it now, meaning active, is an intranasal deep swab. That's the, the mucus for there is, is the, it's showing that's the best, the highest rate. Of, or if you're going to get it, that's where you're likely to get it. But mm-hmm. that's not 100%. The blood test is to tell you if you've ever been in exposed to it and your body's created an antibody to it. Right. So there's a difference. So, excuse me, there's something called an IgM and there's something called an IgG. The IgM is the acute one, meaning your body is fighting it now. The IgM means that your body has seen it and has created a response to it. There's also data to support that um, the people who get it but don't have any symptoms, asymptomatic, don't create as good of antibodies as the people who had symptoms. Right. So, yeah, so it's like you could, you could test positive for the antibodies, but could also have not had it and vice versa. Right. So it's like the testing can't be a hundred percent. I'd imagine like whatever is available, if the NFL season does kick off, we, they will get, you know, the best thing that money can buy. And if someone does test positive, they will be getting tests probably administer them daily. So whatever the lowest possible number of days missed, uh, is within the range of outcomes. That's what the NFL players or coaches or whoever gets it will end up getting. So it's a tricky situation. Um, I, I definitely agree with you in that fatigue would probably be the biggest concern here for me um, when it comes to these players. And like for that reason, what, are you looking to avoid players like Mark Andrews, who has, I believe, uh, type 1 diabetes, John Brown, who's like sickle cell, things like that. I saw in the comments that people were like, Mark Andrews played such a, such a low snap rate last year because of the diabetes, and that's why they kept him on a, a low snap count. Um, I don't know if that's actually false. I can't. So, so here, my, my, my best friend growing up has had type 1 diabetes since like he was like three, like one of the earliest cases ever. So I know, re- I know a, lot, a lot about type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes in athletes is unique. Nowadays, 
uh, Medtronic and a bunch of other uh, companies, uh, just the one that popped into my head, create really good insulin pumps, okay? So it's basically like an artificial pancreas. It's ridiculous. If you say, I want my blood sugar to be 75 the whole day, regardless of what you eat, if you put it in correctly, the, the numbers and in, in, in algorithm into the into the machine, it will keep it at 75 the whole day. Is that unhealthy just on a human level to do that? No, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, that's basically what your body does naturally if you don't have diabetes. Uh, I mean, it will fluctuate, but it, it, it's pretty steady. You don't okay. want to drop in too low or you don't want to go in too high, then that's true diabetes. Uh, you're going too low, you're going to, you, you end up uh, crashing or, or becoming hypoglycemic. So, the, the cool thing about the, now the technology these days is these guys can play with this. It's, uh, they have sensors in their arm. They're like little uh, stickers almost. Uh, and they measure the blood sugar every minute or however they have it set, five minutes. And then it sends it, the information to the, um, to the actual little device. It almost looks like a beeper, like a pager. Um, and that is uh, hooked into, in, in, it has a little uh, tube that hooks into you. And then it constantly delivers insulin as much as you tell it to. So it's a constant information system. Uh, and you can check it, you know, a, a very famous quarterback uh, who, who makes, <laughs> makes me laugh every time I think of him. Jay Cutler was type one. For, he's been type one for as long as we've known. He did fine. I mean, relatively. All right, um, he, didn't, he didn't have to move out of the pocket, though. I mean, he's a special guy in his so own. You're life, saying that this won't really affect like a market. Like that's not the reason his snap counts were were lowered. Like. Not in my. They shouldn't be. No. That if if it is the case, then he's not. His diabetes isn't well controlled. That's okay. a different discussion. Okay. I'd I'd imagine it was given the fucking fact that he has whatever resources he kind of wants Correct. at his disposal. All right. So. A lot of COVID talk. Let's pretend that COVID is not a thing. Let's pretend the NFL season is going is <laughs> to go beautiful. on as normal and everything is back to happy real world stuff. Something that seems a little outside of the real world is the fact that your Patriots went out and signed Cam Newton to can I rock this. <laughs> you can rock that. Yeah. I mean, we might get some negative <laughs> reviews on the podcast. Let's go Cam. Go see your Patriots. Ridiculously good deal for them. Mm -hmm. Cam's obviously dealt with a few injuries. He passed his physical though. Uh, I, I, you know, last year he obviously left early with the foot injury and that ruined the entire season for him. He's had the shoulder issue as well. Like, what are your concerns for both of those injuries for him and whether or not you think they'll affect him in 2020? Because this is a team like they went from a team where we didn't know how they were going to perform to a team that could be a true, I, I want to say contender if Cam Newton plays, you know, 80% of what we're used to seeing out of Cam Newton. Uh, the Patriots signed him to a small deal, so it tells you that, you know, they kind of had the leverage there. And uh, it, it's an interesting case, man. And uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on whether or not Cam can, can hold up here. So Cam has two major concerns for him. Do you do something with your mic? Shit just got crazy. Mm -mm. No? The volume, nope. the volume, you started yelling at me, and it was very disrespectful. I didn't do anything different. Is it? Uh, can you turn the volume on your mic down a little bit? How's that? Sounds better, yeah. I think so. I didn't touch it. It's way the hell over there. That's wild. Yeah, it just started like fucking blasting, and I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> well, I usually don't turn it up that loud. Maybe there was like a delay or something. Maybe. Um. So, there's two main issues with Cam. One is his foot. Yep. Two is his shoulder. His foot injury is what delayed and caused his poor 2019. This is a big deal injury. And unfortunately, he suffered it early in the season. And as a result, he missed the whole season pretty much. Right. A Liz Frank injury is significant. It's like the, the Liz Frank uh, complex is a ligament that's kind of interwoven in between bones. Uh, it's like the middle of, it's the middle of your foot. So it's like the middle of a bridge. So basically break the middle of the bridge and expect to drive over that bridge. Not happening. So he had a screw put in it, which is what you need to do. Um, and after that, the rate of re-injury is very low and the success rate is very high. Hollywood Brown played on a screw all last year. He just had it removed. So um, I'm not concerned about his, that part of his foot in general. Cool. Once he had the surgery, once he 
gets back to running and being normal again, he should feel fine. His shoulder, shoulder. is a different story. That's the concerning part for me. Okay. And, and, and he's had two surgeries on his shoulder, which is not comforting. He's had, uh, I'm looking at his, his thing right now. So um, he had uh, surgery in 2016. Well, ended up being 2017. In March of 2017, he played the 2018 season. And then he injured it mid-2018. And he underwent surgery again the following January. Yep. Um, last, basically last year. So um, why is this such a big deal? So unlike, like, uh, if you remember uh, Andrew Luck, remember his name, he kind of forgotten. Uh, he had a shoulder injury way back when. Mm -hmm. which was a labrum issue. This is not the labrum. This is probably worse than the labrum. The rotator cuff is a group of four muscles and they're responsible for everything we do out in front or overhead. So anytime you do anything with your arms extended, you have to use your rotator cuff. Well, throwing is the epitome of using your shoulder. So and if that's the case, if he's trying to throw the ball far, uh, you have to use a combination of rotator cuff, but also AC joint and a bunch of other stuff. If that tendon is beat up and torn, like it was multiple times, he's not going to have the strength and he's not going to have the zip. That's why he had to have it repaired. Once he re-injured it, whether he re-injured it by throwing, whether he re-injured it by taking a hit and trying to break his fall and it tearing again, um, that that this is the most concerning to me he needs to i need to see how he performs with his shoulder i'm not overly concerned about can his time foot. can time fully heal this surgery or is this one of those where you know he's gotten two of them so at this point there's no way that it could be as strong as it once was is, is that one of those yeah i mean uh without obviously seeing his imaging um even if it's perfect again, it's never perfect. It's never the same. Uh, these these are just these take a long time to heal. These take Alshon Jeffries took nine months to heal. To give you an idea of what we're talking. When when so, did he have his he had his surgery? A couple of years ago. Three. I mean, you remember he's not throwing the ball, so, so it's a completely so, so different time situation. Wise, yeah. So time wise, we weren't necessary. We're not um, worried about it. Like, oh, he's going to be getting back to the season as soon as his surgery timeline kind of timetable return adds up so, to it. It's, it's more so just like whether or not he can get that strength back now. I mean, the good news is he's had, I mean, he obviously didn't do much last year because of his foot. So right. he's really had a good year and a half, almost two years to rehab this shoulder to get it as good as he can be. Obviously all it takes is one hit for him to, to try to break his fall and he tears it again. That's possible. But right now you're going to see the healthiest cam you've seen shoulder wise in a long time. Okay. So you feel, you, you feel relatively good about cam. This year. Yes, I do. I okay. do. And I think uh, Josh McDaniels will tailor an offense around Cam. I mean, Cam was a beast when he was younger. Man, he that's was never thing, a really like, good accurate. You know, he wasn't a good thing, accurate passer. But. Yeah, with Cam, it's like he we don't need him to be throwing for 4,000 yards. Like, that's not what he does. If they can tailor an offense around him, which the Patriots have done so well over, over the recent years, tailoring it to, to Brady not throwing it deep, getting quick, short-hitting passes that kind of rack up over time and uh, getting Cam Newton out there to run on the edge, to run up the goal line. Like, Tom Brady, I just heard a stat today that Tom Brady had, I believe, 20% of the Patriots' uh, goal line carries or inside the five-yard line carries last year. I mean, Cam is easily going to see that, if not more. You look back at when McDaniels had Tebow. I think Tebow had about five to 600 rushing yards, six touchdowns or something like that. So, you know, a lot of things can go in favor of Cam Newton. So, if, I mean, this dude, I, I still think he's got a relatively high ceiling. You know, if he's if the foot's not a concern, uh, if the shoulder can be 75 to 80% of what we want it to be, I think he could easily finish inside that top 10 quarterback spot. I think – in super flex leagues, he gets a little bit risky, and you might want to pull back on that. But in one quarterback leagues where if he doesn't work out, you can just go grab somebody on the bench or someone off the waiver wire. I think Cam is fine to, to grab him at, his, at like a top 10, top 12 price. I, I missed him in Scott Fishbowl because of just the timing of it. He went earlier than I wanted to take him. But, I mean, I, he's risky, but he's got monster upside for his price. So speaking of the, the Liz Frank, we have Evan Ingram, who is dealing with the Liz Frank injury. 
And there was videos that surfaced on his Instagram, which have gone around Twitter and whatever. And we both watched it before we got on here. Now, I'm not one to look at Twitter videos. I could care less, but I would like to get your perspective on it because sometimes you can see a video and maybe prior to seeing it, you know, you're someone who needs to, if you're not dealing with the patient specifically or personally, like you don't know how they're reacting to it. So maybe seeing a video before it, you're like, you know, we won't know if he's actually good to go. You know, 50% of people can make cuts like this at, at this timetable and 50% of people can't make cuts like this. So was there anything from that very small Instagram clip that, that should warrant hype out of Twitter? Or is this just like, you know, business as usual for the timetable that he's returning from? He looked good. I mean, he was aggressively cutting, or at least it looked like yeah. he was aggressively cutting. Uh, and that's all a good sign. The issue I have with Ingram, we know he's talented. There's no question about that. He can't stay healthy. I mean, if you look, he's been in the league three years. We, uh, his rookie season, he played all 15, 15 of 16. Then in, in 18, he played 11. And then last year, he played eight. He's going in the wrong direction here. Um, I mean, and it's not like it's only been one issue. He had a concussion in, in his rookie season. Then he had some rib issues. Then he had another concussion in, in, in this next preseason. Then he had a right MCL or knee injury. Then he had a hamstring injury. Then he injured, re-injured his right knee MCL again. Now he injures his left uh, foot. So it's like, it's not just one injury. He's got, he's got this body part, that body part. And he just can't seem to, to stay healthy. If he can put it all together, he would have a monster season. It just the, the injury um, is just not on his side. I'm not overly concerned about his foot. I'm assuming he had surgery. Um, but um the overall just, body of yeah the overall historical injury history from i mean it's just I, I mean if he could pull something like a keenan allen who who went he had two or three rough years who he, i think he played like a yeah, total i'm, of I'm old enough to remember years. when when keenan was like the most injury prone player in the world yeah he got a brand new contract and then he tore his acl halfway through the first game of the season so after bad. missing half of the season before with i think he, he broke his ribs and lacerated his kidney or something so it's like that was a bad, you know, two years, and then he's played every every game since, three yep. years in a row. That's funny so how that like, happens in the NFL. We always see that, man. So I guess yeah, it's it's um, it's a risky pick for sure. Um, but I I don't know. Ingram's probably a guy I'm fading. I'd rather a lot of people always throw around like league winning players and shit. And like at the end of the day, like Evan Ingram. I don't see him being on the Kelsey level. I don't see him being on the Kittle level. And if you're not there, you're not a league winning tight end in my, you know, if you're like the tight end five on a points per game basis, which is what Evan Ingram probably would be um, if he could stay healthy. I don't think that's like league winning. So I'm not willing to reach for him. If he drops down to tight end 10, tight end 11, which is where I think I have him around in my rankings, given the injury history, given all that stuff baked into it. And the fact that they got a lot of weapons there now, uh, they got golden. Yeah. State have Sterling Shepard who's low-key average I, I think over eight targets a game last year Darius Slayton had a mini breakout in his rookie year should be more involved Saquon Barkley is going to be fully healthy this year so there's a lot working against him injury is certainly uh one of them and I would like to take a second to talk about uh the work that Dr. Morse has been doing on has been working on behind the scenes very very in-depth man he's been doing breakdowns injury breakdowns both video profiles and write-ups on every single relevant injured player going into the 2020 fantasy football season that is included in the big dogs draft guide uh he also has his stuff up on why don't you plug the the url the website that you got going on over there uh you have it on a couple places uh if you just want directly uh one thing or or or, or just to, to get the to get the thing right now you can go on our patreon site um it's on my my twitter handle um if you are a one that likes to use um, sports injury predictor, um, who who has really good stuff and they and they kind of map out all uh, all the injuries and timelines and everything, uh, my descriptions are going to be at the bottom of that. Some of them anyway. Um, 
but and then if you want to watch the videos you'll have to become a subscriber but i think those drop on the 15th what, next week or whatever it is so you, there's a there's a, the only three ways you can get it right now okay so we'll have the url for dr morse's patreon uh link down below so you can get the full guide through there you can get individual players as well you could purchase those uh by themselves on the patreon and then again they are part of the big dogs season long draft guide so you get all of our top sleepers must draft players busts rankings things like that his his injury guy will be included uh the easiest way to do that is by going to monkeyknifefight.com use the promo code bdge when you deposit 10 bucks you will get access to all of the guides aforementioned let's get back to some feet talk it's like we got a fucking foot fetish with all the injuries going on over here let's talk about debo Debo Samuel broke his foot a couple weeks ago. Really disappointing because he was on a trajectory to break out. And you mentioned Scott Fishbowl before. I actually just grabbed Debo. We're in the 12th or 13th round, I think. Mm -hmm. I grabbed him that late. And even then, I, I didn't feel I didn't even need to grab him, to be honest with you. I put him in my queue along with a few other players. And I didn't realize that it was automatically going to draft him as soon as my it fucking pick came up. So the yeah. guy before me picked. And then all of a sudden, it took Debo. But I was like, all right, we're in like the 13th round. I'm not like too upset about it. Because he was just such a beast down the stretch, and I assume that had he been healthy, they'd use him the same way. Maybe by the time he gets back, they do start using him the same way. And Scott Fishbowl, I'm looking more towards the end of the season where it's like, okay, I want to make a playoff run because you got to beat out 1,200 people. So I'm not necessarily yeah. worried about a floor. I'm more like, you know, week seven through 15, my team's got to be clicking on all cylinders. So I'm like, okay, maybe Debo fits that role better than someone who gives you a little bit of a floor. But Debo has his broken foot. Apparently, he's going to be on the mend for about three or four months, which is very, very – very big timetable and that intertwines with the beginning of the season and anyone going into the season who's already banged up you know a few weeks in like okay I can understand if you're getting back to like 90 100 percent a week or two before the season starts that's when I start feeling a little bit more comfortable but if you're not going to be healthy until like you know a few weeks into the season I, I I uh am extremely hesitant to come anywhere near drafting you because the re-injury risk is going to be there you're going to push yourself you're going to want to push yourself to get back on the field with your teammates and whatnot so tell me how you feel about Debo is he just a completely do not draft for you right now so here if it wasn't for this injury he's a he's a great buy he would probably wouldn't have been in my top 20 to 25 yeah for sure the issue I have with this is the timing of it he suffered it on June 16th or at least that's when we heard about it he probably had surgery in the next day or two. The data shows you do not want to return before 11 weeks. Really 12, probably 12 weeks is more is, is a better timeline. Before that, you have a significant re-injury risk. So my, my partner, Celine, actually did the research. Um, and the, the important thing to note is that that's right around like week one or two. So if, 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 that's assuming no setbacks. That's assuming everything is perfect. If he's not feeling 100% by, you know, the end of a training camp or basically week one, do they put him on the pup? Do they dilly-dally like they did, like the Bengals did with A.J. Green last year and ended up missing the whole year? So that there's this kind of concern where I don't know if he rushes back, it's bad for him and for the team. If he delays it too much – they're they're gonna either gonna have to burn a spot or they're gonna have to pup him. So it's like there's this in between. If it happened in April, he would have been good. I think he would have been fine, but it didn't. Um, so uh, in a redraft, you're probably gonna have to reach for him a little bit unless something comes out saying that he's gonna miss time. And at yeah, that he's, point, he's certainly not a guy I'm gonna be reaching for. I'm not gonna draft a guy that's that we already know is injured. There's no reason to do that. Yeah, I mean, he's had other issues, but this is by far the most important. Um, it, Jones fracture is um, Jones fracture is 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 a big deal. I mean, Jones fracture is, is breaking the base of the fifth toe. Uh, a bunch of players have had it. Um, uh, Greg Olson, uh, Julio uh, had it way back in the day. Uh, Greg a Olson, bunch of guys. He had it like semi recently, and that's what kept. He had twice. Him, like, yeah. re leave. You know, he came back. He was injured going into the year. Re-injured it right away within like a couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he broke the screw yes. again, like the second time. Yeah, so he's got to have then, a time. Uh, he probably had a timetable similar similar to what we're looking at with Debo, assuming because he went into the year a little a little banged yeah, up. Yeah, but um, so I mean, 
it's not a, it's not a career ending injury, but it's definitely a, an unfortunate injury for timing wise. Yeah, I mean, it could be a season ender if you push it. We've already seen that multiple times. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate for uh, for Debo. I also want to say because a lot of you guys are going to end up commenting on the video below and say like, oh, what about him? What about him? Uh, we had Dr. Morris on the channel, I want to say like three or four weeks ago. We broke it down into two separate episodes, uh, one with quarterbacks and running backs, one with wide receivers and tight ends, where we covered a lot of the guys that you're probably asking about in the comment section. So if you just go back to my channel and type in Dr. Morris on it, you'll see the other two videos that we did about a month ago, um, just because I know we're going to get 17,000 comments. On. I love you guys' comments. You could still comment them if you want to. I'll still give them a heart and probably reply to you for no reason, but I just want to save you all some time if you are planning on doing so let's uh, let's dive back into the feet let's dive back into the feet and this one is uh, another new england patriot dealing with a foot injury uh for like the third straight year and that is sony michelle and he was someone that was so easy to fade coming off last year like wildly inefficient looked terrible um but i thought he had a lot working against him so i was willing to give him one more chance this year because he was starting to go in like the ninth tenth round they signed cam I got really excited because I'm like, okay, could we see some sort of efficiency bump to the degree what we saw with like Mark Ingram last year running with Lamar Jackson? Like we know Mark Ingram, you know, five yards per carry. He's not the best runner in the NFL. There's no reason he should be up at that efficiency mark where the best runners in the NFL are. But when you're running behind an offensive line like Baltimore's and you're running behind a Lamar Jackson who opens up a lot of holes because the linebacker's got a freeze on him, can Cam do the same thing for Sonny Michelle? And then we get the news dropped on us about Sonny Michel getting a repair on his foot, which is supposedly just not a big deal. It's more so to, I don't know, to ease the pain or whatever, but that's the fucking issue here. He's always got pain in that foot. So I don't know what you know about the, the specific surgery itself, or is this something that we should expect just forever for Sony? Is it going to continue to take away the explosiveness that he showed in college that he kind of has yet to show in the NFL? Like, what are your, what are your thoughts on Sony as a Patriot fan too? So the reason why I write my injury draft guide um, is as in depth as I do. And people are like, why are you writing two, three, four pages for each guy? I'm like, because yeah. this is not a one word answer. Medicine is not black or white. It's right. shades of gray. Uh, and it's in that. And, 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 and why, why, uh, why I go back is because that's when you find out, all right, is this guy running track? Was he playing football? Was he was he playing basketball? That shit How actually makes me laugh tear? a lot when I read your injury things, and it'll be like, "Oh, Sonny Michelle was born here to apparently, you know." I mean, I'm like, "Yo, Doc's getting like really in the fucking grit with this. I love it." I mean, so but that's the problem because you find out about things that were buried that you wouldn't find out about. Right. So Sony actually tore his ACL in high school. Uh, no one ever talked about that. Um, and the crazy part is, him and Nick Chubb went absolutely nuclear in college together. Mm -hmm. um, he's got a lot of wear and tear on that knee. So you're already looking, what, five years past his ACL tear? Um, and then he injures his meniscus. Then he has a meniscal scope last year. He tweaks it again. Now they lose their fullback, which is the Patriots are notorious for using a fullback. So now he doesn't have anybody blocking for him, and he's got to create his own area of separation, which is – not good when you're used to having someone else do it for you. Um, we know he's talented. I mean, he had um, he had six touchdowns over the course of the Patriots' last Super Bowl run. I mean, he could do it. Yeah. Um, but um, the problem is he didn't do much last year. He didn't even get over 100 yards at any point in time, like the whole season. He was terrible last year. The O-line was was pretty terrible at run blocking as well. That, that was my hopes. It's like, okay, Cam comes in. Maybe the efficiency goes up from whatever it was, like 3.6 yards per carry up to maybe 4.1. And he gets, you know, 8 to 10 rushing touchdowns and kind of like rolls his way into an RB20 finish or an RB18 finish when you're getting to draft him at RB30. That's my hopes. There's really no ceiling for Sonny Michel because he's not explosive and he's not going to get pass catching work. But the efficiency could absolutely be there for a big touchdown and, you know, just volume season. But it's like if these foot injuries keep popping up, you know, do we start seeing more trickles of Damian Harris getting on the field? And Rex Burkhead, if he's healthy, I think he's going to take five to six touches a game. James White's going to get the passing work. So it's like, yeah. Uh, so so we, we hear about this foot surgery that he had in May. We were like, wait a minute, what? Um, what did he have? No confirmation. There, here's the options. 
a lot of guys deal with foot injuries. Very important uh, body part that's underappreciated, especially in these athletes. Ask Julio Jones. Um, bun bunion surgery, possible. Julio actually had a bunion surgery. Turf toe, what we call neuroma, uh, uh, Morton's neuroma, which is a ball of, of, of uh, nerves that collect underneath one of the toes that feels like you're getting stabbed every time you step on it. It's awful. Uh, there's so many things that this could be. Um, but the, the report was that this was more um, maintenance than, than true treatment. So if there is some sort of comfort, I guess that would be some of it. Um, he's definitely semi-risky. Uh, I, I, my, my injury guide has him at a 6 out of 10 for risk. So some I'm kind of in the middle to higher and not quite uh, Geis or any of those guys. But, um, but if, if he's expected to be the primary back, they didn't draft anybody. Uh, Damian Harris it has a good pedigree. So we know he's lurking. Whether or not he ends up putting it together is a different story. They just restructured uh, Burkhead's contract the other day. Uh, and James White uh, is going to get through the passing, so he's not going to get much rushing. So they're giving Sony the benefit of the doubt. Whether or not he he does it is is a different story. They drafted a fullback. If this is the season to do it, this could be the season to do it. That's what I mean. Like we might get a little bit of like a you know lightning in a bottle here to the to the lowest degree that you could possibly have with Sony Michelle, but I think it's possible. Um, so I, I think he's someone that I'm willing to take a take a uh, a dice roll on, you know, later later in drafts because I think he does have eight to ten uh, touchdown upside with you know 200 plus carries there. Uh, definitely yeah. not normal possibilities. Let's talk about Mr. Joshua Jacobs. He's the last player that we're going to get into today. We had a few people asking about him. Now I don't I don't think there were any like injuries last year that were overly concerning that we need to like touch on. He's not going to have any injuries from last year that he's dealing with now. I think the overall, I think the discussion that I'd like to have with you here is that, and this was something I talked about a lot on my channel last year. And the reason I stayed away from Jacobs was because we never saw him get a featured workload in college while at Alabama. And most people were like, Oh, well they don't, they just always have talented running backs. And I was like, yeah, well you also look at Derrick Henry. He had a 300 touch season on the, on the resume at Alabama. You had Eddie Lacy, he had a 300 touch season on the resume. You know, all the guys that were like true workhorses in the NFL were workhorses in Alabama at Alabama at one point, never happened with Jacobs. Damian Harris was the guy who was splitting carries with him. He was the starter over Jacobs. So my concern was like, we never saw him do it in college. So just to assume that he's going to get that round one RB one uh, workload out of the gate. I thought it was a little bit naive of fantasy players and he didn't hold up for the entirety of last season. How concerned are you that we're going to see this kind of thing repeat year over year because we haven't seen him ever actually handle a workload. So he actually had an impressive season considering the issues he went through. Hold on real quick. Do you have people like right outside your door? Um, the PT guys are around the corner. Okay. For some reason, every time I hear them talking, I start hearing it getting really loud from your mic. Uh, that's weird. I think uh, is it better? There. Yeah, you're good right there. So the issue with, with Jacob, Jacob's had a, actually a pretty impressive rookie season considering what he there went he through. Is. So, I mean, he, he only played in 13 games, um, but he, he missed a couple of those games with, with injury. So he probably really only played in like, I don't know, 11, probably somewhere around there. Uh, 242 carries, which is pretty good uh, nowadays. Uh, 1,150 yards, seven touchdowns, 4.7 yards per clip. And this is dealing with multiple, you know, issues. He had... Uh, he had a but he also caught you know 20 passes so not bad uh, we know Gruden loves a grinder remember Cadillac back in the day um and I think he still has the potential to be a three down back I actually drafted him in the Scott Fishbowl as my primary running back along with Eckler it depends on who you want to look at as primary but so but let's talk about some of the injuries and whether or not I, we should be concerned for 2020 okay so remember that he actually got sick last season and he lost 10 pounds early in the season. I don't so remember that's that. That's hard. Actually. Yeah, that's hard to uh, – it was early in the season. That's hard to get through while you're still grinding without missing any time. Uh, when you lose 10 pounds, you are very dehydrated. You're not eating your normal bulk of food, which means you don't have the same amount of energy. Um, 
you know, then he had this minor hip injury that didn't cost him any time. He had a groin injury that didn't cost him any time, probably the same injury. Um, then he had a f- elbow injury. So, he, I mean, he had a lot of stuff that never ended up taking him off the field. The thing that ended up taking him off the field was a shoulder issue. The shoulder issue was the thing that we still really don't get clarity on because they called it a fracture. Now, there's really only two locations that you can technically fracture and still play because if not, it'd be you, you wouldn't do this to your star running back. So you can have a small avulsion fracture off the shoulder blade, which is where the rotator cuff inserts to, or you can have a small fracture around the rim of the actual ball and socket, the actual shoulder. Um, and that's usually when you injure your labrum and it pulls a little piece off it called a bank heart. Um, it's hard to tell which one was which. And they said his MRI was negative, but it wasn't negative. There just wasn't anything significant on it that they wanted to report to us. Um, the good news is that he kind of was able to play with through it. Um, you know, and that makes that, that, that gives me some comfort that it wasn't super concerning where he ended up having to go and go the knife and end up having, you know, have something fixed. So um, they finally shut him down and that was the extent of it. Um, but I mean, when he finally returned, uh, he still got 26 touches on 43 snaps. That's a pretty solid workload for someone yeah, I mean, coming back from injury. There's no doubt that they're going to, as long as he's on the field, they're going to feed him round one draft capital type volume. That's what's exciting about Josh Jacobs. And it wasn't just the volume. Like when he was out there, he was good, man. He was the most elusive mm-hmm. running back per PFF last year. Uh, everything lined up for him to absolutely smash coming into 2020, but we still have yet to see a full season of Josh Jacobs just be the guy, handle the workload, and prove that you know the 220 pound mark on him is not just a mark, and it's actually something that he could utilize to his favor and and stay healthy. Um, so, what, what what's your confidence level that he can in fact handle you know these high workloads? Given his history, do you think that we should be concerned about him not being able to hold up over the course of a year? There are, there's some concern that he's going to suffer some nicky knack injuries that are going to prevent him from playing all 16. If he can put together 14, 13, 14, uh, really top level games, I'll be happy with that. Uh, swapping them out. Hopefully those games, uh, those weeks aren't overly important. Uh, yeah. And there, you know, so you have someone that can, you can slide in, but he has the potential to be a top five back. I mean, sure. he, he does. If, you, if, if Gruden gives him the workload, if he gives him enough passes. Um, and, and, and I think he's know. one of those dudes that like, I don't even necessarily think he's going to need a big uptick in passing work. Like, yes, he'll need a little bit, but give him 40 targets, which I think he'll have no problem this year. He could be, he could lead the league in rushing yards. Like him, Nick Chubb, Derrick Henry, all are going to be in the same echelon of pure rushing yardage numbers I think if they're playing the same number of games the question just becomes like are you you know willing to flip the coin on him playing 13 or 14 games because by the time August rolls around like you're not going to be able to get Josh Jacobs at like the 209 or the 210 like you're you're most likely going to have to get him at the back of the first maybe early second round like people are you know with fantasy people are becoming more privy to the guys who might have that top five upside so they're willing to to use heavier invested draft capital on a josh jacobs because if they hit it's such a big reward and if they miss they're like fuck i missed out by three picks you know it wasn't worth trying to get the value instead of missing out on jacobs so it's like fuck like am i comfortable using a first round pick on a guy that we might project to play 13 or 14 games that's you know that's the question at hand i think I mean, all of these guys have have their potential issues. You yep. know, we still haven't confirmed that Dalvin is going to play. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't know the work share between Chubb and Hunt. Um, you know, we assume CMC and, and Zeke and Henry are going to be able to continue to do what they do without missing any time. Uh, Kamara and, and Saquon, can they bounce back from their high ankle sprains? So your concern for Jacobs is no no higher than most of the backs in the same range? No, I mean, he's a top 15 back that has top five potential. He has risk like all of them. His risk score is six as well. So, I mean, um, they he, he suffered some Nicky knack injuries, but he played through them and he was really good when he was on the field. So, um if he's on the field, I'm not concerned. If he suffers a big enough injury to keep him off the field, so be it. 
but going into the season, there is some concern that he can't handle the workload. But um, he can put it together. I, I, I feel confident that he could he could have a fantastic season a la Dalvin Cook two years ago. Yeah, for sure. He's someone that I want to uh, definitely have uh, at least a, one or two shares of on my team. So I'll be pissed if I missed out on him. The ceiling is, is absolutely there. Uh, the concerns are there as well. But like you said, the concerns are there for every football player, um, as they will be for the entirety of the season with COVID and everything that we talked about. That will wrap up today's episode. Uh, there was a lot of good info in there. That was, a, that was a good conversation. Dr. Morris, one of our, I think one of our probably best ones yet, one of our more helpful ones to the people out there who have no idea what the fuck is going on. Like I said, he came on for two episodes prior about a month ago. So if you missed those, go check them out. I'll link them in the description. I will link all of his social media, Dr. Morse's stuff in the description as well. So make sure you are following him because he'll give you breaking real-time reactions to injuries as they occur. I'm sure we'll have him back onto the channel as well at some point again in the summer if we get some real physical contact between football players, more injuries will start happening, as well as in season as we did last year with the uh, weekly episodes covering all the guys that got injured throughout the week. Um, so again, Thumbs up, subscribe to both of our channels, all of our socials, all that stuff. Draft Guide, also linked down below. Dr. Morse, thank you for joining me. Until next time.